Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Lawrence McDonald. I lead the communications and policy outreach work here at the Centre for Global Development. And uh, I'm delighted to be um, sharing with you this book by a visiting fellow here at CGD, Ethan Kapstein, um, with the title AIDS, Drugs for All, Social Movements and Market Transformations. And um, Ethan was telling me before we began today that his preferred main title was much more about social movements and market transformations with AIDS as a case study. But um, the publisher, Cambridge, said, no, you really need to put AIDS in the main uh, title because that's the thing that people will buy books for. And then recently he was at the World Bank Info Shop and uh, inquired about that and they said nobody's buying books about AIDS anymore. <laughs> so uh, depending on your particular perspective, it's either about AIDS or about social transformation. Um, uh, I've been reading it and enjoying it a great deal. I'm interested in both the AIDS treatment access movement and in possible lessons for others. And I'm very pleased that we have with us two um, experts in other campaigns that I'll be introducing um, after Ethan speaks. Um, one an expert in uh, maternal mortality and the other an expert in climate policy. And I think that Ethan has done a terrific job of not only telling in great and sometimes quite exciting detail the heroic efforts to provide uh, treatment to millions of people who would have otherwise died without it, but also to provide a a framework in which to analyze that and then to attempt to apply that framework um, to uh, other movements. And um, I hope, Ethan, you won't think that I'm stealing your thunder, but I think it's, it's worth just naming his frame because um, that'll be a recurring uh, theme, I think, throughout our discussion today. And uh, Ethan will presumably explain them more, but he talks about industry structure, framing, of how you frame the issue of movement coherence, which is something that uh, he singles out both the maternal mortality and climate as being particularly lacking in coherence, advocacy strategies to address costs, and finally institutions to stabilize the market. Of course, there'll be many views in this room as to whether or not this is the right frame, and that's one of the things that we'll be discussing today. Um, he then goes on, and I don't think we're going to have time to cover them all today, so I just want to read you the list of things at the back of the book is the part I found most interesting in terms of other cases. He looks at malaria no more, maternal mortality, clean water, non-communicable diseases, education for all climate change, the elephant ivory trade, sex trafficking, and abolition of the trans transatlantic slave trade in the 19th century. So um, there's a huge amount of knowledge in addition to the very, very detailed account of the AIDS access uh, treatment access movement um, in this book. I commend it to you. Um, it is not dry. It's very exciting read. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Ethan Kapstein. He's, as I said, a visiting fellow here at CGD. He's also senior director of research at the McCain Institute, a think tank uh, associated with the uh, Arizona State University that's based here in Washington. And he's also senior advisor for economics at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Ethan, please. Please welcome Ethan Kapsky. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here in our new home. You know, this is just an amazing tribute to Nancy and, and all the colleagues um, who've created this wonderful Center for Global Development, um, which um, just has a very special atmosphere, this place. It, it's really a jewel. So it's fantastic to be here in, in our lovely new space. Um, I should say the book is co-authored with uh, Josh Busby, um, uh, a young scholar by my reckoning, young scholar at the University of Texas at Austin who regrets uh, not being with us today. Um, you know, many young people, and I see that there are lots of young people in this audience, which is great. You know, I often hear from young people, they don't have heroes anymore. You know, when I grew up, people had heroes, and a lot of young people say they don't have heroes. I can tell you one thing about writing this book is I've got heroes. You know, a lot of the people we feature in this book, to me, are true heroes. These are people who made possible access to life-saving drugs for millions and millions of people. You know, I worry on a daily basis about things like getting my research funded, you know, which foundation is going to give me a grant. You know, these people worried about how to get drugs out to millions of people, and they succeeded. Uh, so, 
you know, it is a heroic story. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, we kind of take it for granted. I grew up in Greenwich Village in New York City. Um, we had a lot of uh, gay friends, of course, growing up in that neighborhood. My parents were in fashion and the arts, so very much a milieu that I knew. I mean, the idea that um, we would ultimately create a regime that would make AIDS drugs available globally, I just think it's something that no one could have possibly imagined at the outset of this horrible crisis when people were treated with absolute indifference, at best, hostility, of course. Uh, at worst. So, you know, what the AIDS community has done is something miraculous, and I think it does deserve the attention of other movements. Uh, it, it is an incredible social movement in American history and in global history uh, more generally. So, for me personally, a very moving uh, story. I, I do want to say at the outset, and I think this is really important, and Lawrence, you kind of alluded it to it with people not buying AIDS books anymore. There is. Um, there is complacency. There is AIDS complacency right now. You know, when I've been giving this talk uh, around the country and, and in different uh, parts of uh, Europe and around the world, people are surprised when I say that 10 years ago there were 1.9 million deaths from AIDS. Last year there were 1.8 million deaths from AIDS. Okay? The number in Africa has decreased dramatically. That's true. But AIDS is still with us. It is still a global problem. It has not been beaten. Far from it. And you know, people just don't seem to recognize it. There is AIDS complacency. And I think that's one of the hardest things to fight right now. There is a, and that's why I say I, I use the word success with some circumspection. You know, there was success in rolling, a, rolling out AIDS drugs globally. Uh, millions of people are on AIDS drugs, whereas only a handful were not so long ago. That's a success as we view it. But that does not mean that AIDS has been defeated, has been uh, beaten. And I think that's really important. Uh, I should say that Mead over here at CGD has done some of the most important work by my reckoning on the challenges that uh, the AIDS community faces going forward. In his work, he's really detailed those challenges. I wish um, he could have been with us today. OK. So uh, the questions that we ask in this book, there are two really main questions we ask. The first question is, um, how did AIDS advocates succeed in transforming the market for antiretroviral drugs from one based on ability to pay and when AIDS drugs were first introduced in 1987, they were the most expensive pharmaceutical ever put out on the market, about $15,000 a person a year. At that time, the most expensive drug ever put out. Of course, now we talk about drugs that are a couple hundred thousand a year. Um, but still, extremely expensive, only available to those who could pay out of pocket. And of course, later on, as insurance companies began to reimburse those who had very sophisticated insurance coverage. How did we go from a market where the drugs were limited to that community that could buy them to a market which is now based on global access? That's what we call a market transformation. And you know, again, as an economist, when I think um, back on my economics training, probably many of you have uh, had economics training, I can't remember really the idea of a good ever being problematized. There were public goods, there were private goods, there were inferior goods, there were normal goods. I don't ever recall um, learning in microeconomics about how goods could be transformed. In this case, from private goods into what we call merit goods. You know, how does that transformation occur? And we think it's uh, a very uh, significant uh, process. So that's the first question we ask. How were AIDS drugs transformed from private goods into merit goods? The second uh, question, the more general question, again, as Lauren suggested, is how do some social movements succeed in transforming markets, like the abolitionist movement in 19th century uh, Britain, while others have struggled or failed, like the climate change movement, uh, like Occupy Wall Street, uh, perhaps the modern anti-human trafficking movement today. So that's the broader question that we're asking. What lessons perhaps can be derived 
from the AIDS case uh, for these other movements. And I think this question is critical um, because, you know, I think, let's face it, uh, let's be friends here in this audience. Uh, I think quasistas generally tend to think that, you know, because I think this is the most important issue in the world, everyone should think it's the most important issue. Don't you get that my issue is so important? You know, what's wrong with you? Uh, don't you know the ice caps are melting? Don't you know that, you know, children are dying needlessly? Uh, you know, um, so the question is, why do some issues get on the agenda when others don't? I, I know when I, um, years, uh, years ago, I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs about the new global slave trade. And, you know, again, when I went around to get funding to do research on modern slavery, I got thrown out of one office after the other. I mean, I would raise this issue of modern slavery, and immediately the eyes would glaze at all the usual suspect foundations, and I just could not generate any interest. So the research I did for that, I did out of my pocket. I traveled throughout Asia for a lot of places. I paid for that out of my pocket. My colleague, Josh Busby, who's been very involved in climate change, um, has kind of, I think, felt a similar frustration at various times. Um, that, you know, the movement just has not been, so, you know, one of the things that Josh and I sitting down uh, were thinking about is, well, what lessons can we draw from this case um, for these other issues? So that you're not just running around saying, don't you know how important this is, you know? Um, I should also say, though, we don't believe this book's a history of the world. I mean, we are looking at cases which focus on market transformation. A lot of social movements are concerned with non-market transformation, so like the peace movement. Um, you know, do the lessons automatically apply? Maybe not. Though we do think, you know, more broadly, there are perhaps uh, lessons uh, that, that movements might find useful. Okay, so what do we find? In the book, we argue um, that there are really five kind of essential elements in, in, which help us explain um, the uh, AIDS uh, movements, success. And again, by success, our dependent variable, to use a social science term, is the number of people on treatment in the developing world. Okay, so what we're interested in is how do we explain that increase from zero to about nine million people who go uh, and receive access to treatment? How do we explain that? Okay. Uh, and I should say, um, my colleague economist, um, have tended to say, Ethan, this is just not an interesting question because everyone knows the whole story is one of generic entry. That's it. We bring generics and then that's the entire story, so why bother doing this research? You know, economists like parsimonious explanations. They don't like writing 300-page books. I don't particularly like writing 300-page books. I've done it enough. You know, writing in this nice little model is a lot uh, more parsimonious and saves more paper. Um, but, you know, as I would say to colleagues, that makes no sense, your explanation, because everyone knows that generics enter a market that is only fully formed. They go into a market that has been created by Big Pharma and enter it the day, the minute, the patent is no longer uh, in power. That's what a, uh, a generic firm does. It does not want to create a market. You know, you never saw an ad for ibuprofen. You see ads for Advil. So generic companies are not in the business of creating markets. So I would just you know, say that that is one thing we responded to, too, that this parsimonious explanation that's often put out for uh, this uptake of drugs, generics do play an important role, but that market had to be created for the generic uh, companies. Okay. So uh, our five, the five elements of our argument are first, um, what we call a market or industry opportunity structure, a structure that provided opportunities or openings for an advo advocacy movement. Um, and in the case at hand, perhaps the most important opening was provided by the global extension of intellectual property rights in the 1990s. One thing we argue is that movements are going to be more successful attacking industries when those industries are in a period of fluidity or change. I, I would say that this hypothesis is not original with us particularly in the literature on corporate social responsibility, sociology of firms, you find similar hypotheses. 
that firms are more open to outside influence in general in periods of great fluidity or change within the industry. In this period when uh, the TRIPS Accord was being debated uh, was a period of great fluidity and it's one that uh, the advo advocacy movement uh, seized upon um, uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the second was the elaboration by the movement of a compelling frame that associated drug patents with needless deaths. Now the sociology literature on social movements and on framing in particular finds that creating a short causal connection between an action and a needless death is extremely powerful. A short causal connection because that means I can actually influence that outcome. So framing that ties in a very short causal chain an action by a firm, by a government with needless death also is a powerful frame uh, for advocates. Uh, the third, as uh, Lauren said and very crucial we believe, is a consensus around the policy ask. Now, in this case, the AIDS advocacy movement early on cohered around access to treatment as the policy ask versus, for example, rollout of prevention strategies. And there was a very strong focus on this access to treatment. Now, again, with climate change, just to uh, a personal anecdote, my father-in-law is a, uh, a physicist, and he was president of the American Physics Society uh, a couple of years ago. And they had a committee on climate change. And he said you would get a group of physicists in the room, and they would not agree on a climate change strategy. You know, one physicist, oh, nuclear power, they're at, you know, the next wind power. The third, no, well, we don't really believe in climate change, or maybe we need more research on it. So, you know, even among this group of physicists, a kind of epistemic community, as we call it, you couldn't get a coherent ask. Um, so, again, I think that's been a challenge uh, for that community. Fourth, a feasible strategy for extending access to treatment, meaning one that minimizes the costs. One that minimizes the costs. Again, I would say a challenge for the climate change community has been addressing costs. When most of us hear numbers like 1 or 2% of GDP, that's a big number for most of us. That's a big number. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. Okay? And finally, the elaboration of a set of institutional arrangements, like the Global Fund in the AIDS case, to help set the rules for the new regime and lock it in. Because if you don't create the institutions, then you risk rollback. Okay? So you have to create the relevant institutions. Now, there's a famous line in military strategy uh, that a good general, or I'm a Navy guy, so admiral in my case, uh, a good admiral, you know, picks her fight. Uh, she picks her enemy. And in some respects, the AIDS community got very lucky in confronting the pharmaceutical industry and Western governments during the 1990s. For its part, Big Pharma was really focused to the point of obsession, I would say, on the legitimacy of the patent regime. And this was uh, in question because as this rollout of TRIPS occurred, the TRIPS being the globalization of intellectual property, you had debates. I don't think people sufficiently appreciate how deep those debates over TRIPS were. Uh, for example, even within the Western community, the OECD countries. OECD countries had very different views among themselves about what should be patented. So even among OECD countries, to get convergence on a patent regime was incredibly problematic. Pharmaceuticals had not been patented in many countries until quite recently. So even the idea of pharmaceutical patents was fairly recent. So this idea of getting this done was really of an obsessional concern to Big Pharma. It was the focus uh, for them. And as I say, I think one of the genius moments of the AIDS uh, regime, and a, a particular guy, Jamie Love, and I saw at least, I don't know if anyone from Knowledge Ecology is actually here, or any of you here? Okay, so you know you're you're a great leader, uh, Jamie. Oh well, don't you know? Uh, 
Jamie really, I think, did play a great role in that space. Of, he's obviously aware of it. We're all aware of it. But uh, that was, I think, genius because um, I, I think what people don't sufficiently appreciate is for the health community to hear that the way to enter this industry opportunity structure is through trips. That was a very novel idea. You know, for people in the health community to think, gosh, we can gain leverage over this debate through the World Trade Organization. That was a very novel idea. And I think that was really, um, it was genius on Jamie's part, but it was genius on the AIDS movement's part, Health Gap and others, to recognize that that was a good strategy. Um, so that was certainly important. Uh, and when drug companies attack countries like South Africa that tried to make access to drugs uh, more available by relaxing patent standards and were sued, that blew up in their face. So even the business-friendly Wall Street Journal collect, uh, questioned the collective sanity of the industry. One of my favorite uh, stories in the Wall Street Journal began, as we all know, the Wall Street Journal is the business organ of the American media. Um, a story in the Wall Street Journal begins, can the pharmaceutical industry inflict any more damage upon its public image? Well, how about suing Nelson Mandela? <laughs> so, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, the, they, they set themselves up. So, you know, you had a flat-footed opponent, and that certainly was helpful. And at the same time, government officials were very dubious about the feasibility of rolling out uh, these drugs to resource-constrained environments. And, Andrew Natsias, who I think is a good guy, um, you know, anyone in public life, they're going to utter all kinds of things, and some of those things they're going to regret. Uh, Andrew Natsios uttered a phrase, which I'm sure he deeply regrets about the problem of ARV rollout, which is, in many parts of Africa, people do not use Western means to tell time. They use the sun. These drugs have to be administered in certain sequences at certain times during the day. So. He felt like if people don't have watches, they're not going to be able to use the AIDS drugs. But you know, the AIDS movement was smart, because at the same time, they had run a number of trials to show that these drugs could be rolled out effectively in resource-constrained settings. So again, you had shown that you, you know, they questioned the critics very effectively by showing uh, trials that, um, that this would work. Uh, so what are some takeaways for other movements? Um, from the many cases that we've looked at, we'd suggest the following. First, in order to be effective, a movement needs a coherent, focused policy ask. And again, I think one problem the climate change folks face is they're all over the map uh, in terms of their ask, OK? Carbon taxes, more use of alternative energy, you know, whatever. Second. If the costs are too high, if major players have to give up, if they have to give up things of great value to them, it's going to be a lot harder to fight the to advance the agenda. Um, Deb Spar, now president of, of uh, Barnard College, um, when she was at Harvard Business School, wrote a case on the Free Burma movement, and the ask of the Free Burma movement was to get Unical to dismantle its gas pipeline running through Burma. And like Deb says, no, sorry. You know, that's their one gas pipeline. That is a very high cost ask of Unical, even if they wanted to promote that movement. You know? So a high cost ask for the major player is going to be much more problematic to uh, advance. And third, movements need to be attentive to institution buildings. Uh, institution building. Because if you do have success, you want to lock in that success for the long run. And to do that, you need uh, sustainable institutions. So thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Uh, thanks very much. I'd like to invite our two discussants to come and take your place at the um, table. Um, while they're taking their places, you know, Ethan, as you were talking, I remember seen a film produced by Paul Farmer's organization. I don't know if anybody else saw that film. I forgot where I saw it. I forget what the film was called. But a woman stood there who was in late stages of AIDS and pretty obviously dying. And then they said, you know, and we gave her these drugs. And then you see her again. And it's a matter of, I don't know, a couple months, maybe six months later. And she looks fine. 
And I, it, it, up until then, I had thought, as Andrew Nazio said, you know, these things are too complex, they're too tricky, they're not going to work. And for me, that was an incredibly powerful piece of film. And I think that that's just a nice example, as you say, that the uh, treatment access movement used that very well. I'm also thinking about your link between, you know, an action and a preventable death. And that's where uh, those of us who are active in the climate movement in one way or another have a real challenge. Uh, that and coherence. Um, our, our first discussant, I'm pleased to introduce, and I'm going to introduce them each before they speak rather than in turn. I should say our two discussants are Jeremy Schiffman and my colleague Michelle De Nevers. And I've asked Jeremy to go first because um, he is an expert in, among other things, uh, maternal mortality and framing. And I think it's less of a stretch from the AIDS, AIDS, AIDS movement analysis that's the core of Ethan's book to the uh, global health areas that um, Jeremy uh, works in. He's a professor of public administration and policy at American University and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. And I'm pleased to say he was also at one point a visiting fellow. And I had the great good fortune to uh, learn from Jeremy. Uh, if I remember correctly, Jeremy, before you became an academic uh, studying how movements work, you were at Burston Marsteller? Public affairs. So he's both a practitioner and a student of uh, communications. And I always felt very um, humbled in your presence because I figured you knew a whole lot more about what I was doing and why I was doing it than I did myself. So I'm very excited to um, hear your remarks. And then we'll hear from Michelle. Please. Well, thanks for the kind of comments. I felt humbled in your presence <laughs> with your amazing expertise. Um, uh, this, this is an excellent book. And I, I wish there were more works like this in global health. Uh, I, I really appreciate how Ethan and Josh draw on a wide array of theory from economics, political science, and sociology. And I think they do develop a parsimonious explanation um, concerning why some social movements are able to transform markets. Alongside, and this is really what, what is wonderful, it's a very rich historical narrative that makes this explanation very compelling and convincing. Um, this is not just a study of the AIDS movement. It's, the book is aimed to spark inquiry on what makes global social movements effective more broadly. And so I wanted to focus on that in my comments and, and raise three large questions on this subject that I think follow quite naturally from the work that Ethan and Josh have done. The, the first question is one they raise themselves, which is what kinds of features of markets make them amenable to being contested by social movements? And Ethan and Josh, and I think one of the most interesting and original parts of the analysis, they point to two features. One is industry concentration, which means having a few firms dominate the market it, um, so that you have be, uh, very few veto points. You just have to convince a couple actors. And the other, which Ethan mentioned, is the fluidity of the market rules, especially if they're new and changeable. So that then they're not sticky. I just wondered if um, another one, just to throw, open up this question, um, concerns the nature of the product itself that the market is producing. So especially, and this is mentioned in the book, is the product uh, essential or detrimental to the pr preservation of human life? Um, so we might expect, and we have actually seen success in movements surrounding landmines and smallpox, presumably because of the very nature of the product itself. So there may be other factors that people want to consider. The second big question that I want to throw out um, that emerges from the book is, under what conditions does and should market transformation become a central element of social movement strategy? Um, in this regard, I think it's worth noting that their work is an analysis of one variety of social movement. And Ethan just noted this. Um, it's one in which the functioning of the market is central to advocacy objectives. Um, but there are other kinds of movements where that is much less the case, where the target is predominantly the public sector or social institutions, and much less so product markets. So think about civil rights, for instance. Um, so this points to one obvious condition where market transformation would be a central strategy, and that would be where the private sector happens to be a primary source of the good that is being sought. And in the world of global health, that condition would vary by issue. 
Although <clears throat> I find it hard to think of a global health issue where that condition is not, at least in part, true. So it's certainly true for the big communicable diseases, AIDS, TB, malaria. It's also true, but perhaps to a lesser extent, for other health problems low-income countries face, such as newborn survival, primary health care provision, improving the quality of the workforce, where public sectors and nonprofit institutions play central roles in the provisions of these goods. So I guess the question here, the second question is, how should social movement strategy vary by the degree and nature of private sector involvement in the issue at hand? The third question I want to raise that follows from their study is, under what conditions are social movements, including ones that pursue market transformation, the, dri the actual drivers of social change? In the case of ARVs, the role of the movement is clear. It was a major factor behind the reduction in drug prices, and as a consequence in the reduction of the number of people dying from the disease. But even the authors of this book hint that this isn't the whole story, because they note that even as AIDS deaths continued to decline, even as the movement became embroiled in conflict and lost energy. So there are other social processes going on besides the, what the, the influence of the movement. There's often a tendency, in, um, and I'm not saying it's in this book, but elsewhere in, in social science research, to, if you see a large social, and in practitioner work, if you see a large social movement on the one hand and you see social change on the other, you presume that, that the social movement caused the social change. But that's not always the case. And I've been wondering about this with respect to an issue I'm quite close to, which is maternal mortality. Um, we've seen an annual decline of about 3% per annum over 1990 to 2010, roughly the time a global initiative existed on that issue. It's not at all clear what role the initiative played in that decline. I can think of a number of other major factors that are not or only loosely connected to the initiative that were probably central contributors, uh, among which are the growing use of contraception, among couples in low-income countries and rising education rates for women. So movements have to be seen in a broader context as one among many elements that shape social change. So I raise these three big, quest big questions around social movements for further discussion. Um, namely, what, are, what other factors besides those the authors identify make markets amenable to contestation by social movements? Secondly, under what conditions should social movements target markets as a central strategic move? And thirdly, under what circumstances are they actually the drivers of social change? I raise these not as a critique of the book, but, be, but precisely because the book is so strong and so provocative that I think that these questions emerge quite naturally from the work, the excellent work that Ethan and Josh have, has done. Uh, Jeremy, uh, thank you very much. Um, you've raised a number of excellent questions, and I'm, I appreciate both you and Ethan uh, being so concise in your remarks, because it does mean we'll have time to explore and come back to those questions and also to hear from our audience. Our second discussion, is, our second discussant, I should say, is my colleague, Michelle Denevers. Michelle is a senior visiting associate here at the Center for Global Development. Uh, before that, she was uh, for 29 years at the World Bank, where uh, she was a senior official involved in a range of environmental policy issues, uh, most recently, of course, uh, working on climate change. And I'm very pleased that Michelle is now uh, here with us working on uh, climate finance and also part of a larger team that is working on uh, tropical forest issues in, in connection with uh, climate. Um, Michelle, you have um, seen uh, climate policy, climate finance policy up close and personal. I'll be very interested to hear uh, your reflections on Ethan's book and on the lessons that he draws for the climate movement in particular. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Um, are there, I see two people that I know here who work on climate advocacy. Does anybody else work on climate advocacy? Okay, one, two, three, four, great. Um, I was, I'm asking that because I would have liked suggestions from people in the audience as to what the climate people can learn from this book. So um, for years, climate advocates have been scratching their heads about how to get more effective climate action, particularly here in the United States. The political obstacles in the United States are very high, ranging from a lot of noise by 
climate skeptics who represent a very small part of the population, but they're noisy. Um, overall, weak enthusiasm for foreign assistance, which is an important part of the climate agenda, promoting assistance to developing countries to reduce emissions and more importantly for ad adaptation to climate change. And to very active lobbying by very well financed vested interests, particularly in the fossil fuel industry. Um, so when I heard about Ethan's new book on how to succeed in social movements and market transformations, I thought, great, he's going to tell us what we can do in the planet. <laughs> but as you heard from Ethan, pretty much, um, you know, my reaction in reading the book was was a lot of disappointment because. You know, climate change just fails in every one of his criteria for what you need to have effective social transformation and market action. Um, while the goal of reducing the price of ARVs it can be seen as analogous to the price of raising the price, the goal of raising the price on carbon, um, the mechanism to reach that price change is quite different. Uh, greenhouse gases come from a wide range of different sources across sectors, energy, transportation, agriculture, forests, etc., cetera, and, um, and market activities. So requiring transfer transformation of these markets requires actions in multiple domains, and you don't have this nicely concentrated industrial structure that, that Ethan said was a good thing to have. Um, some sectors, like the oil sector, are highly concentrated, but they're global and there are, are a large number of firms, so it's not a good situation. And in terms of the stability and robustness of rules, many of the rules that have, the few rules that have actually been implemented in the climate area are relatively new, like CAFE standards for cars or the reduction on emissions from coal-fired power plants, which are all being contested in courts by, by their opponents. So the more stable rules tend to favor the bad guys, the fossil fuel companies. Also, the victims of climate change are not subject to immediate illness and death, as they are in the case of AIDS. And the, the people who are the most vulnerable to climate change, the biggest victims, are people in poor countries that most people in this country have never even heard before. Wouldn't, couldn't find it on that. So it's more difficult, I think, to, to build a compelling case to assist these people in far off nations than, it, than there was to build a case to assist people who you see right here at home. They'll have friends who have AIDS. And the upfront costs of government action uh, to transition to a low carbon economy are quite high. So while the advocates were initially united around the carbon targets, as Ethan said, to create binding emissions reduction targets, these have been watered down in the recent negotiations and are now at a point where the targets are going to be voluntary and it's kind of do what you can, maybe if you're in the mood, um, not, not anything very binding. Um, the incumbent firms, especially in the oil industry, have fought vigorously to spread information and to defeat policies that would raise their costs. So Ethan concludes that unless advocates can find a structural handle of concentrated activity, identify a more compelling time frame, cohere on a common ask, and lower the costs of action, put in place policies to reward low carbon investment, the chances of market transformation remain slim, which is really a bummer. But <laughs> as I looked a little bit more closely at it, um, I, I did find some areas that I thought would be useful to bring to the climate space. Um, one of the things that Eason said is that if the cost of the ask is high, uh, that makes it particularly difficult. Well, one of the most important asks that exists in the climate space is what to do about how do you eliminate fossil fuels? You know, energy accounts for about um, I think 39 changes from IPCC report to IPCC report. It's a very big part of the issue is energy from fossil fuels. And there was a report about a year and a half ago that many of you may have seen that the value of fossil fuel assets on the books already of proven reserves is about $20 trillion. So what you're talking about is creating a stranded asset of $20 trillion. That's a big cost in any sense. So how can, how can we learn from Ethan's book about what to do? So as I poked around in, in some of the tactics used by the AIDS advocates, 
I did find some positive suggestions. One of these, the one I like the best, is the idea of targeting corporate reputations by targeting specific firms as well as industries and bringing negative media attention to this target, naming and shaming, et cetera. So this could potentially be helpful in targeting the fossil fuel industry and the large anti-climate action lobby financed by the Koch brothers. Um, so the idea of making fossil fuel companies the enemy in, in a similar way that Big Pharma was in some sense threatened with becoming the enemy, I think could be a very useful tool. I, I think that action on fossil fuels is, is really important. The second, I think, really good suggestion that Cuban has is clarifying the ask. So that means not just focusing on trying to get agreement on binding emission limits and getting a price for carbon, but when I think about trying to clarify the ask in the climate space, maybe what we need to do is think of phasing the ask as a set of different asks over time and agree what's the first, you know, what's the, what do we focus on first and then come to it later. So one way to think about this would be to de disaggregate across sectors and over time. So I would suggest maybe start with the coal industry which is already happening to some extent in the United States, although it is contested. Um, the new rules that have come out by the EPA will pretty much shut down existing coal-fired power plants, but they're all about 50 years old anyway and they're going to shut down. Um, whether or not we get rules that will make it sufficiently costly to capture emissions from new coal-fired power plants, I would suggest that should really be an immediate focus in terms of where climate advocates focus their ask for now. I think the second is on renewable energy. And as Ethan said, there have been a number of different, different instruments, all different kinds of subsidies and feed-in tariffs and this and that. And I think getting some coherence on what is it we really want to ask for for renewable energy um, to get that kick-started would be an important one. Uh, and then later on, maybe you can come to agriculture and forests. We have a project here in CGD in forests where the ask that we're focusing on is trying to increase funding to reduce deforestation and try to increase uh, the approaches that actually pay for the results of reducing deforestation, not just paying to train people how to measure carbon in their trees, but actually paying to reduce deforestation. So I think this idea of getting more clarity on the ask and getting some sort of consensus among the group, or groups in this case, is a very useful suggestion. Um, the other one that I came away with is that we should take advantage of recent extreme weather, like hurricanes and the polar vortex and whatnot, to create a constituency in this country for action on climate. And it's a, little, um, it's a little disingenuous to do that because it's not clear to what extent these recent, client, recent, recent weather events are climate caused. Many scientists think they are, but it's not entirely clear. And as I said earlier, most of the people who will be most severely affected by climate change are not in this country, they're poor in the poor countries. But to get people in this country to think that they are severely affected by climate change could be really useful because then they will create a constituency to advocate for action in our political space. Um, and that could help to accelerate the time frame. Okay. Um, and the last thing I came away with was I was going to suggest that um, Bill McKibben and his team read this book <laughs> as they go forward. I wrote Bill. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, because they have a very specific ask at the moment. They're folk, well, they have two. One is Keystone and the other is getting fossil fuels out of the investment portfolios of universities. And those are, I think, quite specific, and, but I think I have a lot to learn from this book. So. Um, Michelle, thank you very much. You know, in our day-to-day -day work together, we don't often get to have discussions about this kind of thing, but um, I was uh, pleased to hear you say <coughs> among your list of things that um, going after the firms, and I would say, in fact, the CEOs, and, and making it clear um, using social opprobrium um, can be a powerful driver, and um, maybe if I can take advantage of my role as chair, even to offer my own question and comment for you. My initial response in trying to apply your framework to climate was to 
uh, think that it didn't fit. But in hearing Michelle, and I, th I think it's in fact extremely useful, but I think there's a very important distinction that would cause us to not necessarily be as pessimistic as Michelle's first remarks uh, suggested. And that is, and I think somebody else touched on this, the, I think there's a distinction between transforming a market where you have something good, like um, reduced mortality or ARVs, and you want more of it supplied, and approaching markets where somebody is doing something very bad and you want it to stop. And I think that it's interesting that, as you pointed out in your remarks, that one of the things that the um, treatment activists did was to focus on pharma and TRIPS, and for who th those who don't know, Ethan was referring to trade-related intellectual property rights, focus on TRIPS, and to say that this was an active commission, that they were doing something very bad, and then they started getting traction. When it was an active emission, it was harder. And I think in the case of fossil fuels, we actually have acts of commission, or I would say sins or crimes of commission, and that is confusing people about the science um, engaging in uh, dirty politics, um, all the methods that are used to block action. And I think that that gives the, those in the climate movement an opportunity that is not immediately evident in the book when you think of it in terms of market transformation. I think there's, there's you'll know as an economist, but there's stuff you want and there's stuff you want less of and there's acts of emission and acts of commission. And I think in the case of climate, we have stuff you want a lot less of and you have sins of commission. And if be interested to see how that could be um, uh, framed and, and thought of. So um, with that, I would turn it over to you for any responses that you yeah, might want to make, to, to anything you heard from anybody, and then we will open it to the floor. Well, I'll just very quick while people are framing their questions and comments. Um, just on uh, Jeremy's comment, are movements really the drivers of social uh, change? Um, so one thing that Josh and I um, would have liked um, to create, and for those of you out there, we hope uh, you might think of this. We think we need a data set on transnational social movements that we can work with in a quantitative way, because there is an omitted variables problem when you're doing this kind of work. There is obviously with quantitative research, but maybe you can identify uh, more precisely uh, what the problems are there. So, you know, I think more quantitative research in this field would really be welcome, creating data sets on movements, on outcomes of movements, uh, trying to create proxy variables, and get a, a more, as I say, a systematic handle uh, on what's going on. Because we're all, you know, frankly doing case study research. We grew on a lot of case studies, but they are case studies. So um, that's one thing we'd call for. Uh, but uh, Jeremy, your comment about social movements thinking they're you know, the drivers of the change reminds me of the famous French comment, which is, Monsieur, you think you are like the rooster that caused the sun to shine in the morning. You know, So maybe we have a bit of that problem here. <laughs> there is an omitted uh, variable. Uh, Michelle, your, your comments caused me to think of uh, one issue that we raised in the book, which I didn't discuss, which I, again I would throw out to the audience, is does a transnational social movement, in order to be effective, do they craft a global message or do they craft nas national messages? So for example, in Germany, the anti-nuclear lobby was very powerful. There is a Green Party in Germany, of course that helps. But nuclear power in Germany has negative associations. It's associated with authoritarianism. It's associated with the war. Um, it has these negative associations that movements could touch upon, which don't exist for, maybe it's associated with France, um, <laughs> which obviously, you know, in France you don't have those negative associations about nuclear power. So the same movement would not resonate in France. So, you know, I think one question too is to what extent do you create tailored messages to the national context versus uh, some kind of global messaging? Uh, Josh and I um, ran a series of uh, surveys using Mechanical Turk. That was a lot of fun for those of you in this space. I urge you, it's low cost. And you know, you get a bunch of Indian software engineers who answer your uh, questions. Um, but you know, some very respectable uh, survey people say that you, know, you get kind of decent results. And so we asked a bunch of questions about framing, and very simple questions like, um, would you sign a petition 
uh, for global access to drugs to the following. And then we put like cancer, you know, we had like a list of, you know, 50. And sure enough, you know, AIDS was fairly high, Viagra was very low. But like in India, Viagra was much higher than it was in many other markets. So, you know, again, the national messages may have to be tailored. And that might be something that the climate folks have to think about too, that rather having a global movement that they have to have more specific targeting to fit the national political economy. Um, you needn't address my remark, but the one thing I forgot to say, so, just to come back to it, is I was really struck in your many case studies at the end that you did address the transatlantic slave trade. And you said this is the one instance where there were huge economic forces opposing the change. And I actually think that um, abolitionism in general, including the slavery in the South, is a really interesting case study for the climate movement because if you could frame something in terms of social opprobrium so powerfully, I mean, now none of us would think that slavery is acceptable. There was a time when people did, and I think a time will come when people say, it's just not acceptable to pull fossil fuels out of the ground and burn them and emit the carbon, but we need to make, it needs to be framed as a powerful argu moral argument in order to overcome those interests of Right, lives. but what's interesting about the anti-abolition movement in Britain is that it was not framed in humanitarian terms, primarily. The winning argument, remember this movement, the abolition movement was, decades and decades, you know, this was a long fight. And Josh and I actually, using our framework, we are ambivalent as to whether or not we would have predicted its success. Because it was a very high cost movement. I mean, you've got to deploy the Royal Navy, for God's sakes. You know, that's a pretty high cost ask. Um, but the framing was really fascinating. The framing that succeeded after many decades of trying was that this was corrupt. At that time, there was a, a movement in Britain that was very concerned about corruption within the polity. And so finally, the abolitionists focused on the corruption, the use of uh, slave trade monies to corrupt politicians. I, I think you've just opened yeah. the door for climate, because massive, massive corruption there as well. well so I think, so it's, the, and Michelle mentioned the climate, the corruption angle. The so it's yeah. interesting, the thing that didn't resonate was, don't you know how horrible slavery was? Well, you know, there were a lot of horrible things in Britain in the 19th century, you know, that people were concerned by. But the thing that it was corrupting was very powerful. The other interesting, I think, analogy with the abolition of slavery in Britain is it cost about 2% of GDP yeah. to the British economy. And they knew well, it, and said. they were we would willing not have to do it. it. And so when people talk about climate action costing 1% one, one or 2% of GDP, there's precedent. You know, if, some, if there's agreement that it's important enough to do, people are willing to accept the cost. And that's why we like the historical case in the sense like, you know, we admit we would not, I think, have predicted this as a done deal. I mean, and certainly would not have predicted that frame yet. It was, I think, and then we'll open the floor, I think it's Nelson Mandela who was quoted recently when he passed away as saying, you know, it looks impossible until it's done. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes take courage from that. Well, uh, and again, let's remember the AIDS case looked impossible. If you had gone back 10 years and said, 10 years from now, 9 million people will be on anti-retrovirals, people would have said, you've got to have your head examined. It's <coughs> never going to happen. So um, I do want to go to the floor. If you'd um, raise your hand and identify yourself, we have a colleague in the back. Sneha, in fact, Sneha, there's somebody right in front of you, the gentleman in the purple shirt. He's got his hand up. Uh, please identify yourself by name and organization. I am Dan Whitman with American University, uh, great admirer of CGD. Just one, these might be footnotes, but they might be larger than footnotes, one positive, one negative. Uh, infant mortality by dehydration, would that be an example of your second criterion of a very low cost, you know, saline solution right. that would uh, prevent a needless death? Would that, would that fit into that category? And on the appropriate side, would fracking come close to uh, the coal industry as something to highlight? I mean, we don't know for sure, but possibly the earthquake in this city two years ago uh, might have been a result of fracking in Virginia. Does anybody want to respond to that one? I can collect a few um, more, but what, Ethan, well, you, you address the dehydration and, yeah, and yeah, clean we, water we, in the book. Why yeah, don't you respond to that initially? I mean, we say that actually that's a great case because it's very cheap, as you say, but the community has been, you know, torn about how to deal with the problem. You know, do you drain the swamps, do you, you know, whatever. And so there has been this debate um, about how to effectively deal with that problem. So that's one of our cases of a very low cost solution, a very short causal chain, 
and not as effective as it, as it should be because right. there has been a lack of coherence. I was just saying to Michelle, a friend of mine lives in Pennsylvania in fracking country, and he says the dirty secret is the water table is being destroyed. Well, I mean, the sense that it's being kind of silenced uh, uh, more than maybe. You're on the wrong list, sir. This guy lives there, and he's saying, you know, you, like he'll have meetings It'll with his, con you know, he'll have meetings with congressmen, and, you know, he's kind of a player there, and, you know, try to get the congressional delegation engaged in this issue. But water, it strikes me, is something very immediate to people. And like, if you look at this Charleston, West Virginia thing, you know, the idea that your water supply could be endangered, that might be a different angle, a different framing that could be. I so I just throw it at you. Water know. is going to be the entry point to fracking. It is already. It's the one thing that the EPA has regulated already is the no. release of volatile organic chemicals. I mean, one of the problems with fracking is there are about 20,000 little fracking mom and pop firms. Uh, it's not something, 80% it, of the fracking is done by these little firms and only less than, less than 20 closer to 10 percent is done by the oil majors who actually you know have some kind of safeguard processes and stuff so it's hard to get your hand on it and the whole thing about fracking is interesting because on the one hand natural gas is meant to be a transition fuel to a low carbon economy it's better than coal but if coal is going to be gone anyway and if natural gas is not the end state solution and if you have these potentially significant risks of methane emissions from Fracking, fracking done badly, you will have methane emissions, which some studies show could completely offset the climate benefits of fracking. You know, it becomes, it's, I think it, there's a big question mark about wither fracking. Mm -hmm. I want to, Jerry, if you want to come in on the uh, anti diarrheal and oral rehydrations, my understanding is that that could easily be told as a success story. That there was a clear intervention, it's been funded, it's now widely understood in places like Bangladesh, and so. Um, I'm, when you say, well, there was confusion and it didn't really take off, I'm, this is, I think, one of Jeremy's areas. And perhaps you can yeah, clear I'm up my own to, confusion about yeah. how I should think about this. I haven't, um, I'm trying to recall the details of the history of that initiative, but I think one point about uh, oil rehydration therapy that stands out is it used to be far more successful than it was in the past. When it, um, received, I believe, in the 70s and 80s, more specific focus on that particular issue. And then it gets integrated into a broader child survival initiative, for better or worse. This is actually what happens to pneumonia, which is the leading global leading cause of death for children. It gets integrated into a broader child survival initiative, perhaps for better. But nevertheless, the issue itself loses a coherent identity. And, and does mortality then go up as well, or just I, I don't know. Be, I, I don't know the mortality data, but it points to a, an issue of framing, where uh, on the one hand you want specific identity for particular issues, on the other hand there's push for integration, which also has its benefits, and there's a perpetual tension in social movement and transnational advocacy between integration versus spe cause-specific issues. And I think it's a very difficult one to surmount. It's a perpetual tension, and this issue is based on. Particularly in global health, or would you say that's a wider observation? I don't know. I, I, I continually, continually observe it in global health, but people from other sectors might. I don't know if it's uh, true with climate change or other sectors as well. OK, let's take some more questions and comments from the floor. Um, David? And then maybe the gentleman behind you will, will take two. Um, I know that there are some people in the room who have been very active in the movement uh, itself, and we're very eager to hear from them. I think David might be one of them, but I'm eager for your question. Yeah, well, uh, David Biden uh, with results. Uh, and I, I, I used to be with uh, Global AIDS Alliance. And, um, you know, I, I came into the movement I, uh, after a number of the things that are chronicled in the book. So in 2000 uh, or 2001. And so by then, the prices were already coming down. Of course, since then, they've come down even further. So the task bag that we faced uh, uh, was even more, OK, so what do we do to uh, generate uh, demand uh, and provide the funding for the purchase even of these drugs that are relatively you know, low cost? So I'm looking forward to reading the book. I don't know if you go into um, some of the struggles or strategies that we that we um, tried to use and, and face 
But one thing that I would just mention, because I, I was just reading through the book, and I noticed that you mentioned the importance of some of the direct action that ACT UP carried out during the Gore campaign. And that was a really important historical lesson for us, that those of us who were, were starting and would get it, got involved at that time, at least myself, uh, to understand the power of direct action. So in other words, something very different from a think tank activity, uh, very different from an academic activity, but really confronting a decision maker very directly and personally. And it was interesting to see since, you know, uh, from that time forward, how that was true on a number of other occasions, and how it was also true that, uh, that we could build, um, you know, political support in key congressional districts through face-to-face -face, uh, engagement with people and education. And it kind of, it makes me think of the book, um, uh, King Leopold's Ghost about Gavin yeah, you know, I, I read that actually a couple of years um, ago, and I was like, wow, this guy is talking about things that happened a long time ago, but really some of the same tactics are relevant to us today, even in the internet age. That, that, that kind of face-to-face -face consciousness raising, I think, is still, and I think really you could, yeah, it is really important for us, you know, um, you, know, you can look at the Harvard America tour, or you can look at you know other times, other 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 periods when we were building support for PEPFAR, for instance, and the creation of PEPFAR, and the creation of the Gold Fund, and you know anyway, there were some really key moments like that. But anyway, I guess my my point is maybe for the sake of the discussion, the audience, that sometimes one might assume that that the story ended when the prices came down. Or, or when a corporation said, okay. Um, or one might assume that the story ended when a think tank decided that something was viable, or um, that um, it seemed from a very sort of high-level policy analysis, analysis that a particular strategy could, be, could work. Instead, what you had was a collection of people who were personally affected and were, many of them amateurs, self-educated, Something and, and, and learning as they went along, um, and you personally affected meetings, living with HIV. That then inspired people like myself. Your years later. Um, no, I I, I want to add to that, and I, it's not to dilute your question, but I hope maybe to amplify it. Um, Jim Kim visited us, the president of the World Bank, uh, for a private discussion when we were in our other building, and the question of climate change came up, and he said, "What the climate community needs is act up." So this is not something that is just among the activists. And many of you know that Jim Kim was you know, heavily involved in extending um, HIV AIDS treatments in the developing world. But I thought it was a really interesting remark. I wanted to bring that to Ethan's attention before he responds. And also, I think that we do see, especially in 350.org and in a number of the other um, climate movements, an interest in direct action. I personally share that interest. Um, and, and I think that if we look at, say, the Vietnam War or the uh, civil rights movement, the point at which those movements began to win was when right-thinking people said, well, I agree with what these people are asking for, but I disagree with their methods. And you needed a, a kind of a radical, I don't know French, a radical leading edge to make people upset to the point that ordinary people started saying, you know, they're really right, but I disagree with what they're doing and the way they're going about it. Then you start to win. And as long as the climate movement or any other movement seems kind of reasonable, you're not making traction. So that, that's my hypothesis. You're the expert. I want to hear from you. And you know, what would you need? I guess, so then the people in the center can proceed because you've got these other people on the fringe pushing the way. I think Thomas Schelling called it the rationality of irrationality, right? Yeah. Um, so do you, do you want me to? I, I'm to very interested, okay. yes. Is so, Jim Kim okay. right? We need to yeah, act up. All right, so I have a bunch of comments for um, uh, there. First, uh, thanks, David, for your comments and for your, for your work, really. Um, and, and, you know, again, to me, it's just extremely moving, you know, uh, what folks like you accomplished. Uh, it, it, it is humbling when we talk about being humble. Um, we do talk a lot about pooling demand. So, in a sense, we talk about the supply side and the demand side. And, you know, one of the major issues, which, again, I'm not going to talk to you, you know, and you, you worked it, uh, but groups like yours, like uh, the Clinton, um, Chai, initiative, what they really did was help pool demand. Because, you know, one thing you have to realize, and again, I, I think one of the geniuses of the movement was not to dismiss the entire pharma industry as evil. 
those are like evil people beyond the pale, we won't deal with them. They recognize that, look, these are small markets, these African markets. It's very difficult to reach them. It's very difficult to distribute. These are challenges, and they took that seriously. Um, and recognize, well, if we pool demand, so we're dealing with a larger market, that will make it more attractive to industry, generic and branded. And you know, you're creating a market. So you know, they saw that. Um, but I, I do think that, and I don't know how relevant that is to the climate case, but I, I do think that um, the willingness to work with the industry was uh, very significant um, and to maintain that. Now, I think it's interesting just the ACT UP for climate, because ACT UP, since the global movement was not a direct outgrowth of ACT UP. As a matter of fact, Josh and I spent easily six months interviewing people involved with ACT UP, and we kept hitting dead ends. Initially, ACT UP did not want to have any global involvement. ACT UP was purely domestic focused. And when members of ACT UP went out to the international AIDS meetings, spoke up about the need to make these drugs available globally, they were shunned. They were off the page. So ACT UP was really a domestic movement. ACT UP splintered. So ACT UP created a lot of attention around various facets of AIDS. But it's very important to recall that ACT UP then splintered. There was a separate treatment action committee. There were separate committees focused on civil rights on housing. So it's a very different animal than health gap was, for example, or more globally, you know, chai, the actors who really move the global agenda along. So, you know, I have to think about, you know, I know what he's saying when he says we need an ACT UP, but ACT UP's really a contribution was to put the issue on the map. Mm -hmm. But then the people who move that agenda you know, people like the Treatment Action Campaign, who again, these people who educated themselves in pharmacology, I mean, it's unbelievable what these folks did. They're the ones who actually they moved the needle along at the FDA or in the housing commissions of cities, you know, making sure that AIDS, uh, uh, people with AIDS were not discriminated against in housing. You had very specialized kind of groups. And that's why I say, in a sense, this group to create global treatment access was, in a sense, a specialized movement with a coherent ass. So that's why I would, I'm not sure I would say that that's what the movement needs. I think it needs focus. You know, I kind of like Michelle's suggestion, well, what's really important to the movement now? What can we achieve? Well, maybe, why not take credit for closing down coal plants? That's great, they're gonna shut down, take credit for it. We did that, build on that success. <laughs> and then, I think it has something to do with the falling price of natural gas, unfortunately. Well, no, but, you know, if you can take success for it, then build on that and yeah. have a strategy. Um, Jeremy, did you indicate you want to say something? Yeah, or, yeah, I've been thinking about this issue of social disruption. And it always struck me how unusual, not how, um, oh, how unusual the AIDS movement was in the world of global health, not how similar it was. I can. I can hardly think of any other global health issue where there has been this level of grassroots activism and social disruption. Most, I, I spend a lot of time observing global health policy communities. I'm, this evening I'm going to a meeting on global surgery, which is that surgical conditions are a huge burden. I've been involved in newborn and pneumonia and uh, family planning and maternal mortality. And it's very rare that this gets the issues get politicized, and especially, it's even rarer that they, there's grassroots disruption involved. Um, usually, the dominant mode is a bunch of very well-meaning, and, and I respect these folks, technical elites who have expert scientific knowledge and devise policies uh, for the world. But it, there's no pressure from well, This below. is directly related to the nature of the disease and the incentives that people had because their it lives is. were on the line, it right? It is. At AIDS, you, there is a category of person called a, a person living with, with HIV AIDS. Um, for many conditions, it's difficult. You, you, it's tough to imagine. I'm a person living with malaria. These categories don't exist. But the diabetes folk are, are learning from the AIDS folk. Um, so I, I think a lot of these initiatives within global health need this kind of the, the politicization and the grassroots disruption 
and need to move beyond the, the, tech, the idea that through technical consensus alone you get traction. Of course you need the technical consensus. You do need the clear ask, but you also need the disruption. Jeremy, you mentioned technical consensus. I want to mention a book that my colleague Ruth Levine was involved in here, Million Saved, that looked at 17 cases of sustained, large-scale, successful global health interventions. And one of the key takeaways there was the technical consensus, which has a lot of resonance with your book, Ethan, to say if the experts can agree on what can be done, it's not sufficient, but it may be necessary. But that, those forward. words, are, he explicitly says it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. Um, there's in global health, there's a insufficient politicization in my opinion. Yeah. Um, David. Yes, so I'm going to maybe collect up a few questions. The gentleman behind David, I see uh, Kimberly Elliott, and we'll take a question here. Maybe we'll take a, a last three round unless there's some burning point. So yes, please, sir. Hi, Doug um, <coughs> Mason from the Millennium Challenge Corporation. I was curious if one of the factors that separates success and failure uh, is also the human propensity to discount benefits and costs into the future. And if that separates some of the experiences, and if so, what we do about it. For example, when it comes to human health examples we've been talking about, it strikes me that sometimes it's very personal, and the span over a time can be months to years between you know something happening and consequence. Where with climate change, it could be much more diffuse and play out over decades or maybe centuries. And so, it, to the extent that that also distinguishes between success and failure of these movements, how in the case of phenomenon like climate change, do we overcome that in terms of reducing our propensity to say, look, those costs and benefits may be large, but they're not that personal and they're way down the road. Yeah, I, I think, personally, I think that's the toughest problem with climate change. Kim. Kim Elliott, here with the Center um, for Global Development, and I've um, done some work in the worker rights space. So I've been trying to, you know, as I'm listening and thinking about how do your lessons apply in that space, and I would argue that's Lots of attention, but not so successful in getting changes. Just some, some sort of random thoughts. One was just I was triggered by Lawrence's comment about the sort of different kinds of groups that may be needed pushing in different kinds of ways. And Richard Freeman and I talked about vigilantes and verifiers as a way we, so you need the vigilantes to push, but you need civil society groups that have credibility that can also engage you know, to actually get the deal and then to monitor and ensure that the deal, whatever it is, is being implemented. So I think you do need, you know, both kinds of actors. So in, in the workers' rights space, the vigilantes would do what? Go into factories so and do exactly rapport, reportage? were the ones that were National Labor Committee. Charlie Kernigan up in New York would go out and find these cases of horrible abuses of workers and publicize them and get attention to the problem. And then you'd have other groups that, and, and he would not really want to engage necessarily with others that were willing to sit down and, and work out some of these multi-stakeholder arrangements to do monitoring of factories, yeah. kinds of things. Um, uh, and then I was thinking the markets in flux, um, I think, you know, the end of the global system of quotas in the 2000s definitely put, you know, the, the garment industry in flux, but I think in a way that wasn't helpful because what it did was it got rid of these quotas. China was suddenly, you know, unleashed on the world. Um, and so the, the companies were even less willing to do anything that might raise their costs. And then I was thinking that the third area where the, there is, I, I think maybe it works a bit differently, or, or I, I wonder about the conditions under which the reputation targeting, because that's clearly what a lot of the groups in the, in the local rights are doing, is, is targeting the reputation of, of Walmart or of the Gap or whatever. Um, and it's a consumer product, so they have some vulnerability to that, but at the same time, the ask, you know, is, is, is not one that's cheap to change the entire way you do business to make sure that workers are treated better when, when labor. It's not a huge cost at the retail end, but I mean, in terms of the, of the supply. And so it seems to me that there, it is that link between, uh, you know, sort of they, obviously they care about reputation, but what's it going to cost? And you mentioned Unical. I was also thinking specifically in the AIDS case, it seems to me that on the one hand, you had generics which were not only, you know, lower the costs for, for donors, but was a potential threat, right, to, to, to farmers. So in addition to the reputational risk, they didn't want generics to be sort of completely unleashed. They wanted to be able to compete with generics. And they could do that through price discrimination without <coughs> the fundamental business model of making most of their, their profits in the rich countries. So, so I 
think there was maybe a, sort of a special interaction there where, again, between the cost, but it would cost Big Pharma to do something about making the AIDS drugs available, um, but also the threat from generics if they didn't respond. Thank you very much, Kim, for those observations. I think there was one more on this side of the room. And we'll make that the last question, and then we do have a reception afterwards. I hope that um, you'll stay for that and have an opportunity to speak with one another and with members of the panel. And uh, Ethan says, and I can sign the books. And indeed, we have the books available. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Schwab. I'm with Bread for the World Institute. Um, my question is, and this may have been addressed in the book, and I'm sorry I didn't read it yet, but um, my question is in regards to the role or the extent to which uh, the faith community has played a role or could play a role the faith community, the faith community okay. in these social movements. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of, um, again, you touched on the moral argument and the need for almost the sin element um, making the issue a moral issue. Um, and thinking about uh, movements like the abolitionist movement and today the, the AIDS movement, um, different, a huge you know, variation of involvement in faith on the part of the faith community in those movements. I'm um, just wondering. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to maybe let each of our panelists uh, say something, and then uh, Ethan give you the last word. But to encourage people, if you're thinking about buying the book, I want to read you one uh, paragraph that I think came out of an interview that you did. And it's, there are little gems like this, this sort of sense of, of witnessing history. And this is a conversation when the uh, President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief is being set up at Mark. Um, Dibel is going to be heading that, and he's speaking with Josh, Josh Bolton, the White House Chief of Staff. And uh, I just felt that had this conversation gone differently, then the focus of the campaign might have been different, and that there might have been many fewer people, um, perhaps millions of fewer people, who contracted AIDS, because of the, it turns on whether the key indicator of success is the number of people enrolled in treatment or a decline in the number of new infections. But I just want to read this to encourage you, whet your appetite so that you will indeed considered buying Ethan's book. And Mark Dybel says, one of the things I remember is that Josh would ask the most important questions. There was one meeting six months into PEPFAR and he asked, what is the single most important marker in PEPFAR? I said, well, we have prevention, care and treatment and the reduction in infections is the most important. And Josh said, no, what is the most important marker? And I said, it is the number of people on treatment because we can show success rapidly. Josh asked, how many people are on treatment? I said, 25,000 in the first six months. He said, that's not very much. <laughs> so I don't know if you're familiar with Meet Over's work here. He's very concerned about the sustainability of the uh, treatment regime. And, and I'm probably getting the numbers a little bit, bit mixed up. But basically, for every additional person who's put on treatment, two more people become infected. And despite the billions of dollars spent, we don't even today have decent measures of the number of new infections. We don't track and report on that in a systematic way, despite the availability now of rapid testing that would make that technically possible. And I just, when I read this and I thought, had Mark Dybel said, I told you already, it's the reduction of new infections, we can't currently measure them, but that's got to be the goal of this program, then the outcomes would have been very, very different than they were. And that's, that's one of the little sort of gems of history that are in this book. So I want to leave you with that. Why don't we start here, come down the table, any very brief remarks or not, and then I'll give you the last word. Jeremy. Okay, just one brief final comment about something that I think I really like about the book and I think is relevant to thinking about social movement effectiveness. What they do in this book is the economists always tend to talk about costs and benefits. The sociologists talk about belief systems and he brings in both. So social movement effectiveness is both about understanding costs and benefits and interests, as well as changing beliefs about what's right. The two are not incompatible. Social movement strategy has to integrate both. And I think I commend Ethan and Josh for linking these ways of thinking about social movement efficacy. Thank you, Jeremy. Michelle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so just a, a couple of questions, starting with uh, Derek's about uh, faith, which is very consequential in the American story. You know, uh, folks like uh, Franklin Graham, head of Samaritan Purse, um, you know, Billy Graham's son, who has an epiphany. Of course, the evangel evangelical movement uh, was not very supportive of the uh, gay community in general, the AIDS community specifically. 
Um, but uh, Franklin Graham, one of the leaders of that community, you know, and we interviewed him, and he claims that he had an epiphany. Uh -huh. Now I recall his interviews; it's very moving. Um, you know, because this guy said, you know, I was witness to thousands and thousands of people die. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, you know, he was very instrumental. Abano was very instrumental. You know, Abano uh, spoke to Jesse Helms many times. They prayed together about this. Uh, so, you know, and obviously President Bush. So, you know, this story, I, I've always, I, and probably this is not a friendly audience to raise this, but I, I've, I have thought always that there should be an article about kind of the tragedy of George W. Bush because, you know, there were things like, just as now people talk about President Johnson and the Great Society. I mean, George W. Bush did put forward PEPFAR. He did a lot in terms of uh, human trafficking, you know, much more than some other administrations. So there, there was that element, I think, largely driven by the faith community. Now, what's interesting is if you went to France and said, what was the role of the faith community in AIDS, they'd look at you like you were crazy, you know? So again, I think, you know, these national politics uh, differ from, from uh, one place uh, to another. You know, on your point, um, uh, Dan, Dan, or Dan, yeah, yeah. On the policy myopia, I mean, isn't this the great issue in development, right? I mean, the whole question we ask in development is, you know, it's like that <coughs> Aston the Blue Robinson question. Why do they create institutions in North America and not in South America? You know, like, how do you extend the shadow of the future, right? Isn't that the great question that we all face every day here at CGD? How do you extend the shadow of the future? And, uh, you know, incidentally, one of my concerns about the United States, you know, when I speak to my students, more and more actually want to go to Wall Street. And one reason why they go to Wall Street is they get rich quick. You know, the idea that you're going to spend 20 years working at a firm, building a firm, that it's going to take a long time, now that's not interesting. You know, there's a get rich quick kind of mentality, which makes me nervous. So I mean, I think, you know, if we are facing this myopia problem, well then one thing about your phasing is you've got to get bite-sized chunks. You cannot sell climate change as well. This is something for our grandchildren. People don't care about their grandchildren. You know? <laughs> so you know, you gotta, this is for you. This is for you. So your summer house does not disappear. You know? That's what it's about. Go to Fire Island, and that's where you have the thing. Your house is going to go. You know? Um, so you know, I think appealing to to selfish uh, selfish nature of folks is extremely important. Kim. Um, you know, one thing that your comments made me think about is, uh, again, this national framing difference. So one thing that interests me, like, when I go to the UK and I go to Marks and Sparks or Tesco, all the products are ethical. They're not organic, they're ethical. Now, if I go to Whole Foods, everything's organic. There's nothing that's ethical. <laughs> now, what's interesting is when Tesco tries to open up in the United States, they fail. The ethical branding does not work in the United States. They fail. And one of the things we find in business strategy is that retail actually does not travel well. It's very rare that retail succeeds globally, except in the luxury brand segment. Um, but these messages are very national, you know, that, that consumers respond to. Um, I think the other issue kind of with labor, so I think the kind of labor rights theme, you know, might resonate a lot more to a British audience, let's say, than to an American audience where we have a, you know, well, hell, that's a, you know, I mean, even Paul <laughs> Krugman did, yeah, well, and, and, and Paul Krugman write the article in Praise of Sweatshops, you know, one of the, the famous articles. Um, but I, I think the other point there is that the, the schmata business, which I partly grew up in, my mom was in the schmata business, textile business, it's competitive. <laughs> <laughs> so raising costs, that's, and that's why, you know, we go, in fact, What's interesting is one of the people we take on is David Barron from Stanford Business School. Because David Barron says people will take on a cause when the cost is very low to them. So actually like t-shirts, he says that's a great cause because people will buy a union made t-shirt. You know, if it's another dollar, who cares? Um, but if it's access to drugs, he says forget it. He says forget pharma because you know, people are not going to give up their drugs. Um, but we actually find that he was wrong. It, these, these concentrated markets are much more likely targets because they've got room to maneuver. Whereas a textile firm, you know, they have, and you know, I read, I go to Bangladesh a lot for other work, 
and you know, you talk about how competitive that is among those firms there. You know, who's going to, and that's why you need standards, right? That's why we had standards in the United States uh, eventually. So I think the structure of the industry militates against, you know, really raising the standards unless everyone does it. Thank you very much, Ethan. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to uh, my panelists here. Uh, we do have a reception. We do have books for sale. Um, I hope I've inspired some of you um, to read more in what I think is a terrific book. And let's have a round of applause for Ethan and Ethan.